Okay. Well, thank you all. So, um, let me first uh, remind you again of our recommendation that you, you wear a mask when we're having the uh, sessions inside, uh, except if you're speaking. Um, and uh, I would, uh, I, it's, it's a great delight that I was asked to, um, to introduce uh, today's plenary spe speaker, Haibian von Langewelde. Um, Haib was, has been a, a leading light of the uh, very long baseline interferometry community for a long time. Um, for a decade, he was the director of JIVE, the joint, um, the joint uh, v, uh, in institute for VLBI. Um, and uh, finally got rid of that to do some science, and then now it's been drafted in to be um, the uh, project director for the Event Horizon Telescope uh, project. Um, and besides being an excellent scientist, he's also prescient. I also discovered that in 1994, he wrote a, pop a popular article uh, which, uh, with the title, The Pit of the Milky Way, A Hard Nut to Crack. And I think that was rather fitting for what we're going to talk about today. So, Hope, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jarla. It's indeed uh, great fun to be here. Uh, I spoke about VLBI in uh, Yenam and uh, EWAS meetings for a decade. And now when the uh, resolution goes up by a factor of two, the audience goes up by a factor of even more than two. Great. Uh, I'm also very proud to be here. Um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to speak here on behalf of my colleagues in the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium who have done all the hard work uh, for, for, de for half a decade to get us the uh, CJ star image. And my only concern here today is uh, to do them proud. So here we go, without the titles. We're going to zoom into the galactic center. Uh, our uh, relatively quiet Milky Way has a lot of uh, non-thermal emission, clearly demonstrated by these filaments in the center. Thanks to the Meerkat image, uh, we zoom in further. This is what the VLA sees, a mini spiral. And since the 70s of the last century, we know that there is a compact source. And when we go to middle beta VLBI, we can finally resolve that source. That, la that last twist is to switch you back from galactic coordinates to equatorial coordinates, of course. And this is the imagery we use for uh, popular talks, of course, and we've given very many popular talks. Uh, M87 certainly, but also the recent CJ star result caught the attention of, uh, of billions of, of humans around the globe. And for me, the highlight is uh, what we did last week. Uh, the the uh, Leiden Museum uh, uh, of uh, History of Science now has a disc pack on ex exhibit. Uh, after spending uh, uh, a long time developing better and better recording mechanisms. This, this pile of uh, some 40 terabytes of uh, two-bit sampled radio data, which of course by itself is completely useless, uh, contains uh, JCMT data and a little fraction of that could be correlated with other uh, noise packs to, to give us a, a, a VLBI detection. So, uh, earlier we presented this M87 result in 2019, and maybe that was a, a bit of a surprise, because uh, we ourselves, we were thinking that we were mostly going after CJ star, uh, and, uh, but it turned out that the mass and the distance combination of M87 uh, gives you a 42, what a coincidence, uh, image on the sky, uh, which is consistent with a uh, six and a half billion solar mass black hole at a distance of 16.8 uh, megaparsec. And our galactic center is, of course, uh, much closer, uh, but it's also much lighter. Oh, and I should forget, not forget that uh, uh, since then we have added the polarization information to that image. And in the SS13 dis uh, uh, dis uh, discussion today, uh, we, we've heard the talks about how important polarization is to understand the uh, accretion flow. 
So, uh, from the same observations we have, uh, from the same 2017 observations, we also have five nights on CJ star. Uh, not all that data had ALMA in there. ALMA is, of course, very important to anchor the calibration of all the telescopes. Uh, uh, and so we have concentrated on, on two days, April 6th and April 7th. Uh, April 11th uuh, uh, promises to be also interesting, uh, but most of the data I show is from these two days. We have eight telescopes on the sky, uh, uh, which includes the South Pole that could not see uh, uh, M87. So, uh, I, I will briefly uh, show this movie of all the telescopes uh, that are, of course, at the all high dry sites where there is uh, little water. And actually, if you think about it, it's a remarkable coincidence that the size of our planet and the transparency of the atmosphere just allows us to do a global millimeter field BI, and that these two sources are optically thin and just big enough for us to resolve them. It's really uh, a f fantastic uh, opportunity to learn about black holes. So, uh, together, these telescopes fill the Fourier domain uh, as, uh, as indicated in this figure uh, over a six hour integration. And this uh, image should be better than M87 for two reasons. It is uh, better filled UV coverage with uh, the South Pole Telescope. And actually, Sagittarius star is quite a bit brighter than M87, so uh, calibration should be uh, uh, easier. So why then did it take us another three years to uh, come up with the SJ star image? There's two reasons for that. Uh, uh, there is interstellar scattering of all that, all these electrons that you show, in, that you see in the beginning, all our way, uh, uh, all our line of sight to the galactic center. But more importantly, the source uh, is, is highly variable, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, when we take the uh, calibrated visibilities, and in this graph we only show uh, the uh, high signal to noise data after calibration, uh, which we, by the way, like every step in our process, do uh, in multiple uh, parallel uh, data streams. Uh, then, uh, if you can do Fourier transforms uh, from your head, and I expect you can, you can do immediately deduce that there will be a ring on the sky. We have this Bessel pattern with two uh, distinct minima, and the uh, separation of the minima gives you the, the size of the ring, uh, and the relative uh, amplitude of the minima gives you an idea of uh, the uh, contrast uh, of the ring with its interior. Uh, as you can also see, at, in the minima, not all the baselines are, uh, are, are going down in a similar way. And that could have two reasons. Uh, certainly, there can be uh, 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 orientation effects, because this is a one-dimensional uh, display of, of course, a uh, two-dimensional, uh, two-dimensionally filled uh, Fourier plane. Uh, but there's also variability, as you can see, in uh, some of the error bars uh, 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 not being representative of the spread of the data. And the reason uh, I'm going to, to explain the reasons why it's so difficult to measure, uh, to image SJ star is uh, first this variability. These are simulations, the clock runs fast on these, but on the right you can see uh, SJ star uh, uh, being variable on the time scale, scale that is a thousand times faster than M87. So SJ star, uh, we can expect to vary on a minute scale, and therefore it violates the basic assumption of uh, of, the, uh, of this uh, 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 interferometry, namely that the source should be constant, constant or constant, uh, have a constant uh, image uh, during the, the synthesis. And this variability we can uh, uh, accurately measure because we have two uh, interferometers in our, uh, in our uh, array. And you can see the light curve at the bottom. So that's the total flux. Uh, going up and down, uh, and it's not, uh, it's not that simple that it's just the total flux that's variable, because on the top right we can show uh, the structure function of, uh, a structure function of the closure phases, which are calibration free, and you can see in that that such a star also on uh, different 
uh, UV distances has more uh, power than, uh, than uh, M87 had. So we're dealing with a uh, truly variable uh, source, structurally variable. And then there is interstellar scattering. Uh, the, uh, the, image show, uh, the graph on the right shows the uh, image size of such a star uh, as it's been observed in the, uh, be before millimeter field behind was possible. And uh, with frequency squared, the image size goes down. And only uh, when you get to the millimeter, the scattering becomes uh, subdominant. In the previous years, we have done uh, uh, seven and three millimeter observations, and we think we understand the scattering uh, quite uh, well now. Uh, in the same UV uh, uh, distance figure with the same visibilities, you can see uh, the blue uh, uh, red are uh, two different directions. The uh, 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 refractive scattering adding ex extra noise on the longer baselines and the diffractive scattering uh, giving you a, a blurring kernel as displayed on the top. We have been quite lucky. The, uh, the scattering will not be the major concern in our imaging. We, we, can, uh, we can correct for that by uh, 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 multiplying out the, uh, uh, the uh, scattering kernel and adding extra noise terms when we come to the long baselines. Now we have to image that variable source. And there are various ways to do that. Uh, basically, you can uh, add more and more temporal constraints and get with smaller and smaller data sets, uh, uh, try to uh, uh, make images of very short snapshots during which the source is not uh, changing, or you can uh, average everything together and hope you uh, get a reasonable average source. Uh, we, we've, we've tried various, uh, various approaches, uh, and uh, I will focus first on the uh, attempt to make an average source. Uh, field BI uh, has a reputation for, Field BI imaging has a reputation for being a black belt uh, art, and that's certainly not what we want to do for something this important. So we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, developed methods in which we uh, uh, test how our uh, specific observing conditions, the UV coverage, the calibration, the uh, uncertainties in the calibration, uh, uh, the, the weather conditions affect the data and we give our, uh, our uh, uh, imaging uh, pipelines uh, test data and we make sure that we only work with parameter sets where we uh, obtain the uh, the known image. So we do a lot of simulations to go to the best uh, imaging uh, parameters. And we do la da a very large number of these, these imaging runs. So here you see a, a, a representation, also used a lot, of course, when we do popular talks, of all the images that we have obtained for uh, CJ Star. There are literally uh, thousands of them uh, coming from uh, a clean or uh, maximum likelihood methods, and we combine them all together into the image that probably was on the front of your newspaper. And we do a little bit better than that, uh, than just averaging. We divide the images we have into th uh, three different groups, uh, four different groups, and we assign uh, a, a representat representative uh, weight on these. And so in our scientific paper, we produce uh, a an image like this. We've also tried the other end of uh, the uh, temporal constraints and, and tried to uh, make uh, dynamic images. Uh, then you use only a very small uh, fraction of the data. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, on, on, on the best conditions, we do get uh, the same ring structure back, basically. But it's very difficult to get proper images with proper azimuthal uh, structure. So uh, that was the imaging. Now we have to uh, interpret uh, what, what this ring size is. And uh, just like we've done for M87, you have to realize that we uh, are working with uh, uh, two parts of that uh, interpretation. The diameter scales, of course, with the, the mass of the black hole uh, divided over its distance. So this gravitational uh, uh, angle is important. 
but the other part of it is uh, to make sure that we know what we are looking at. Uh, uh, the Schwarzschild diameter is uh, four times that gravitational radius. The last uh, stable orbit uh, can be anywhere between uh, 12 and 18 uh, times uh, theta g, depending on the rotation. And then there is the, uh, the lensing effect, of photons coming from uh, different directions, being lensed into our uh, line of sight, uh, which can have a dependence uh, uh, which is uh, similar to the size of the last stable orbit. So, uh, to interpret the size of the ring in, uh, in, uh, in factors of gravity, we have to make an assumption of how much uh, photon ring versus how much direct uh, images we see. And to do that, we run uh, a large uh, number of uh, 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 general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic codes and calibrate these in the same way that we have done uh, uh, with the data. But I, I should have focused first on the gravitational radius. For M87, that was a bit of a lucky surprise that it was that uh, favorable. But for the galactic center, we know uh, what it is, of course, exactly because of the work uh, uh, by the, the Gensel and Gates groups who have uh, received the Nobel Prize for uh, measuring the distance and the mass of the uh, center, uh, the galactic center black hole by zooming in on the stellar orbits uh, of stars around the galactic center. And I, 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 I like to show this uh, image uh, to scale so you can realize uh, how far in we zoom on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the stellar orbits. And that's actually exciting because that means there's a lot of room for stars to come even closer and give us even more information about what, what, is, uh, what the uh, general relativistic effects are on the stellar orbits. Then we have to measure the ring size. And uh, like we've done two calibration ways, we have uh, four imaging ways. We have also several ways to measure the, the ring sizes. And we use these same methods again to measure the, uh, the uh, images of the, of the simulations. And when we combine that, we find that, uh, uh, or when we compare all these methods, we find that we can determine the ring's uh, diameter quite accurately at about 51 uh, micro arc seconds. The width is also quite well constrained, but uh, the azimuthal structure and the position angle uh, are a bit more difficult uh, from these observations to constrain. As I said, we do that too for all the uh, simulations. And uh, this is just a subset uh, to check that we get back what we put in uh, uh, for the, uh, the gravitational uh, angle. Uh, and uh, then we can compare the observations uh, with the a priori uh, values. And in this graph here, you see again uh, our different methods uh, now compared with the uh, m over d ratio uh, coming from both the CAC and the VLTI groups uh, for measuring uh, the size and distance of the galactic center black hole. And uh, as you can see, uh, that fits quite comfortably. Now, there's more that we can do with this, uh, with this beautiful image uh, that is so well, uh, uh, such a, a clear uh, confirmation of uh, general, relativi uh, general relativity at these scales. We can also try to uh, distinguish uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, co uh, configuration for the uh, galactic center uh, black hole is the most likely. So from all the simulations, we can uh, exclude some of them because of the EHT scale, some of, the, some of them because of the EHT uh, asymmetry. We can use uh, constraints from the overall spectral distribution uh, from uh, what the image looks at 86, uh, and, uh, uh, 86 gigahertz, and we arrive uh, at a, uh, uh, a, a, a uh, most likely a model that is magnetically uh, arrested, so uh, uh, has a dominant magnetic field, uh, uh, hot, uh, uh, fairly hot electron configuration, uh, uh, large uh, uh, prograde spin, and to our surprise, has a, uh, a 
fairly low inclination. Did that play already? So on the right you can see a, uh, you can see how that image changes with inclination. And if the inclination was edge on, uh, aligned with the galaxy, you, we would have expected to see much more contrast than we have observed. And in fact, that was also found uh, by the uh, gravity team uh, when, they, the, when they tracked the motions of uh, infrared flares around the uh, galactic center. Finally, uh, what we could do is uh, test, uh, uh, test uh, alternative metrics. Uh, and uh, I, I invite you again to come to the, uh, uh, the session uh, this afternoon, the SS13 session, where there will be more talks on this. Um, but the remarkably uh, a reassuring fact here is that over three orders of magnitude, uh, what we uh, find here is, uh, is uh, consistent with uh, Einstein's theory. Then uh, uh, this is not the end. Uh, there are many other uh, tests we want to do. I mean, uh, we were all very curious if uh, from our 2018 data, these black holes look again uh, the same. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, we have options to go to higher frequency and, and uh, push the resolution. We are getting more telescopes in our network, so uh, we will get uh, 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 better fidelity uh, images. Uh, and of course, uh, at one point, we want to address the fact that these sources uh, show variability and that must also tell us something about the state of the accretion disk. So in conclusion, uh, you can read it all back here. We uh, just came from Granada where we had our first face-to-face -face meeting in uh, two years. And uh, all credit, please, to this team. Thank you. Hey, Jarle. Okay, let's open the, the floor for questions to Haim Jan. There's one in the far back there, and then one here in the front. So, Mark, do you want to go first? You've got the microphone first. Yeah, so Mark, are there th very nice results. I was just wondering, apart from these two sources, are there any plans for other sources which might be of interest and sufficiently bright? Yeah, well, first I should have said that, of course, uh, the, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope also looks at other targets, uh, jet physics and uh, polarization studies thereof have been a large part of our, our, our interest, and we had some talks about that today. Uh, currently, we don't have any other targets which are uh, uh, sufficiently heavy or sufficiently close that we expect to see uh, uh, the shadow of the black hole. There is uh, one in the back, sorry. Yeah, yep. thanks. Please. Um, right. Uh, so, yeah, I was thinking about this issue of trying to make a movie. Uh, so this variability, is it strongly periodic? Like, could you use that pretty acidity to increase a single to noise uh, okay. using that assumption? Uh, I hope I, I recall that properly and somebody will correct me. I, I, I think, I think uh, it's not periodi periodically. Uh, it, I think there is power uh, for SJ star. Uh, uh, from, uh, from minutes to several days. So uh, typically, typical behavior is more like flaring than uh, like periodic. Okay, any further questions to Avian? Oh yeah, there's one more in the back. Bit of exercise. Hi. Uh, a question about, uh, I mean, of course you want to, to prove GR or disprove GR. So if you would like to disprove GR, are there features you are looking for specifically or some theory that you would like to explore? 
Okay, I, I feel uh, I should not try to answer that. You should really come to uh, the uh, session this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I, 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 yeah, come to the session later this afternoon. <laughs> Any further questions? Oh, yes, yeah, one further back there. Um, I've read that um, the, um, the day you, or the night of the day you use this data, um, the, um, the black hole was uh, quiet, but a day after there was some activity, and uh, will you also release uh, an image of uh, the black hole when there is some activity? Okay. I'm interested to hear where you heard that. Maybe you heard it from me. Uh, yes, there there are days there the, the data sets in there which are are probably more difficult to process even than uh, the ones we have tried so far. Uh, there's indications from concurrent observations that there is a that there was activity, and. Um, um, Imaging that will be even more challenging than we have done so far. Uh, so that's one of the things we could be working on next. Uh, uh, here. Yeah, okay, there. <laughs> Can the EHT see uh, the larger scale around M87 star to see uh, the birth of the jet, or can it only see the very center? Okay, so uh, we, we, we almost completely resolve uh, uh, the, the base of the jet in M87. In fact, there's a bit of debate about that in the, in the literature. Uh, but we certainly would need uh, more shorter baselines uh, of, of 100 or a few hundred kilometers to uh, uh, bring that also into our uh, images. Okay, and let's have a, a last question here. Um, so, Am I, well, first, am I right to... Um, Where's the question coming from? Oh, hi. Yeah. Yeah. So, first, am I, uh, am I right to uh, assume, um, t for the start of my, my uh, actual question, uh, am, I, am I right to assume that the Fermi bubbles are currently attributed to Sag A star, or...? Yeah. So I've heard, yes. Um, well, in that case, um, how do you square the, uh, the alignment of the Fermi bubbles with the alignment of the black hole? Okay, that's a very good question. I, I, I'm, I'm myself very surprised about uh, that finding. Uh, of course, uh, making the image uh, uh, was, was quite involved, so there are uncertainties. Uh, the azimuthal structure that we see is not very well constrained, but it seems that the lack of, uh, of contrast uh, indicates that the combination of high spin and uh, edge on configuration would be uh, excluded. So uh, these Fermi bubbles uh, have been blown in the past, presumably by CJ star. So that's a, that is a mystery that, uh, well, maybe you want to write a paper about. <laughs> so like. Okay, that is a wonderful point to stop on, I think. And I think we should thank Javion uh, uh, for an excellent talk. <laughs> and now I would like to invite uh, Thierry Fauvel and uh, André Moutinho from ANA up to the stage for the ANA Prize uh, Awards. Um, thank you, uh, is this what, yeah. Thank you, Jarle. Um, I want to thank to the um, EAS, the president, the council for being so welcoming uh, in receiving the announcement of the ANA awards um, in, this, in this meeting. Um, there are, um, this, is the first, th this is the second edition of the meeting and it is the first time that we are having it face to face, so it's also very special because of that. I'm going to pass the word quickly to, well, very soon to Thierry, but I just want to say a few words about ANA. Um, we have the motto, a journal run by astronomers for astronomers, and it has a history. It started 53 years ago, 
as an association of a few countries, five European countries, and the idea at the time was to join a few European bulletins um, and, and have uh, a, a publication with more impact that could you know, face and, and be seen as, as a pair to the American and British publications. Well, today, 53 years later, it's a truly international journal, and it's a consortium of uh, 27 countries worldwide, not only European, and in partnership with ESO, with uh, the CDS, and a publisher, which is EDP. Um, we have been working in this context of a, of a group of, um, of countries doing this together to remove barriers to publishing. So the initial idea of the consortium would be to have a journal in which authors wouldn't have to pay. But now, very recently, we also, there's written in red as a news, ANA has become open access since April. So now we don't have also barriers to, to read. And any country can become a member. So it is truly a journal that belongs to all these countries. It's not just the property of one country or society. And, it's, and, the, and, and the joining ANA is a, an inclusive process. I, I um, invite you to uh, look to search the, uh, the documentary, a lovely documentary on the history of ANA in the YouTube channel. There's a one hour version, but if you are in a hurry, you, there's also a 15 minute version. Uh, and you'll see lots of historical faces. It's a really nice piece. Um, finally, um, yesterday I was talking to Birgit and she sent this uh, message saying, well, I still remember 50 years ago when it was foreseen that ANA would never fly. Well, the impact factors you see below uh, were just published yesterday. And you can see that ANA is doing quite well compared to the other big community journals. And although the, uh, the boards, uh, so this is a reason to celebrate, of course. It's a community journal and it's a very... <laughs> yes. and, um, but still, the board and the, uh, and the editors, we, and I think many of us are critical of what the impact factor is and what it means. And this will need to be discussed later on, but right now we just feel this sense, we just enjoy the sense of celebration. And also it shows that it did fly and as well as the EAS, that also began to fly and has a gr an increasing influence in several uh, ambits like, you know, the, the, well, the satellite constellations, uh, the, uh, the European Commission, etc. Um, the sense that we have gained of European community is real. People decide to publish in the European journals. People decide to be part of the European uh, Astronomical Society and to come to the meeting. So this is, is real. And now we'll pass the word to Thierry. So it, it, it's my pleasure to invite uh, the two recipients of the ANA Awards. Uh, so the ANA Awards are uh, given for uh, a paper published in ANA, uh, one by uh, a paper that's part of the PhD of a student, and uh, the other one to somebody who's uh, slightly more advanced in uh, their career. Uh, I think the limit is uh, about uh, five years five after years. after the PhD. Uh, so the recipient of the PhD award is Adélie Gors. Adélie, please come on stage. So Adélie uh, did uh, her undergraduate studies uh, in Paris at uh, Centrale Supélec. Uh, then, uh, through an exchange program, uh, did her master's at Imperial College in London. Uh, and then uh, did her PhD halfway between uh, Paris and London. Uh, so she couldn't choose between the two, apparently. Uh, she's now a postdoc uh, at McGill in Montreal. Uh, her, the, the paper that uh, got her the award is a paper uh, on the, the effect of the kinematic uh, sunyaev zeldovich effect on the spectrum of the CMB. So uh, the, uh, the kinetic uh, sunyaev zeldovich effect is uh, the effect on uh, CMB photons of being scattered of uh, electrons uh, which originate from uh, reionization. Uh, and 
Adeli demonstrated in that paper that the parameterization that's been uh, used for a long time uh, to describe that effect, uh, the effect of uh, the, asset, the kinetic asset effect on the CMB uh, was quite wrong when compared to uh, simulation. So she came up with uh, an alternative uh, parameterization, which she derived uh, analytically and then uh, validated uh, through extensive uh, comparison to simulation. And, uh, and she showed that this parameterization, which is quite simple in terms of number of parameters, is doing a lot better. Uh, the observations are right now just at the stage where that can be demonstrated, and uh, there is a lot of potential in, uh, in verifying that and uh, deriving uh, unbiased parameters uh, in the next few years. Thank you, Edith. Thank you, Thierry, André. Um, I'd like to thank the ANA Board of Directors and Editors for awarding me this prize today. And also, of course, I warmly thank my two PhD supervisors, Marianne Duspi uh, from the Observatoire Paris-Saclay and Jonathan Pritchard at the Imperial College. And I'm also very grateful for the wonderful colleagues, friends, and family that have been by my side on both sides of the channel. Um, it's been Recently, it's been difficult for early career researchers to promote their work and initiate collaboration. So I'm especially more grateful to receive this prize as one of the first uh, in-person astronomy conferences of the past two years. And to me, the work we do as uh, astronomers is twofold. With our day-to-day -day research, we uh, contribute to the progress of science and of the understanding of the universe. Uh, my work in particular contributes to unveiling the first billion years of the universe, witnessing the birth of the first stars, galaxies, and quasars. And reionization touches many subfields of cosmology and extragalactic astrophysics, relying on observations going to, uh, from microwave, as Thierry mentioned, uh, to X-ray and radio. And this is this variety that's a trigger for collaborations and interdisciplinarity that really um, makes me exciting to study, uh, excited, sorry, to work on reionization and on a very ambitious project such as the uh, SKA. But I think we also have a duty of communicating our work to a wider audience that maybe who is in this room today. Uh, and I did that, I tried to contribute to that during my PhD with a lot of outreach activities. But I know and I'm seeing all the sessions um, this week uh, focused on sustainability, development, uh, education, outreach, and diversity. I know that we as a community are really dedicated to uh, working on these issues. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to many more years of collaborations and fruitful uh, conferences. So, uh, I I'm now calling uh, Yuhe Ning uh, to the podium uh, for the Early Career Award. Uh, Yuhe uh, did her undergraduate uh, studies at uh, National uh, Taiwan uh, University uh, in Taipei, and uh, then uh, came uh, to Paris uh, as well for uh, her uh, master's, uh, did uh, a PhD at uh, CEA Saclay, uh, and then uh, stayed in Paris uh, for uh, a postdoc at the uh, Institut Physique du Globe, uh, working uh, more on planet formation, uh, and uh, very shortly uh, got uh, an assistant professor uh, position uh, in Taiwan at the National Taiwan uh, University. Uh, so, uh, the paper uh, that uh, got her uh, the ANA award for early career researcher is about a very long-standing uh, and fundamental problem, which is uh, the, origin, the universality of the initial mass function. Uh, that traces back essentially to Salpeter in the 50s. Uh, and uh, the issue is that the initial mass function of stars uh, seems to be uniform, even though they were, at the time, and for a very long time, 
no obvious reason why it wouldn't change uh, depending on the local conditions. Uh, <clears throat> in that paper, uh, which uh, mixes uh, some uh, fairly involved uh, analytical work and uh, numerical simulation, she demonstrates uh, that uh, the peak of the IMF, that is uh, the characteristic, characteristic uh, mass of stars, which is about 0.3 solar masses, uh, the most common uh, mass of stars in the galaxy, is uh, the outcome of uh, uh, the thermodynamics of the local gas uh, uh, with uh, some help uh, from uh, tidal effects. And, uh, and that seems to solve a very long-standing uh, mystery. Uh, and I'm quite impressed uh, by that work, I must say. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Thierry and André. And I would like to thank the ANA Prize Committee for giving me this award. This is a huge recognition for me to continue on this interesting work that I have been doing in the domain of star formation. And I'm, at, I'm really happy that this award has been given to a star formation astrophysicist in this time when both black holes and exoplanets have become overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly visible. But I would like to share with you one of my favorite sentences that I always start my stories with, that, that is, you might agree or disagree with me, but this, this sentence is that the stars are the building blocks of our universe. So, um, and in this context, I would also like to thank the organizing committee of this year's meeting uh, for making possible this wonderful in-person meeting and, and this beautiful city of Valencia. I've been enjoying very much the city and the conference as well. And I'm very, very happy to hear a lot of different works in different domains. And as a star formation theorist, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to making a lot of connections to both larger scale physics and both in the scales of galaxies or even um, larger scale structures and also making connections to planetary systems. And I would like to also give my special thanks to a couple of people who are not present here today. First, I would like to thank my former PhD supervisor, Patrick Annabel. He has, um, he has been a very inspiring and encouraging supervisor. He has taught me a lot in, by, by demonstrating how to be a good scientist. And I, also, I would also like to thank Sebastian Schaunot and Homa Desia who had supported me in this nomination to this prize. And finally, I would like to thank all of you and a lot of other colleagues and role models who I have encountered throughout my scientific career, which is just at its beginning, I hope, I hope so. I would like to thank you for constantly reminding me how wonderful it is to be an astronomer and astrophysicist. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're finished. Thank you, thank you both. Um, we are you know, really honored also to give you the awards this year and let's see how we can match this next year. <laughs>